In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today we continue our little discussion on purgatory. Talk about things divine and things holy, things of the faith. Consider this scene from the life of St. Faustina. Once I was summoned to the judgment seat of God. I stood alone before the Lord. Jesus appeared, such as we know him, during his passion. After a moment, his wounds disappeared except for five, those in his hands, his feet, and his side. Suddenly, I saw the complete condition of my soul as God sees it. I could clearly see all that is displeasing to God. I did not know that even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. Even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. What a moment! Who can describe it? To stand before the thrice holy God. Jesus asked me, Who are you? I answered, I am your servant, Lord. He said, You are guilty of one day of fire in purgatory. I wanted to throw myself immediately into the flames of purgatory, but Jesus stopped me and said, Which do you prefer, suffer one day in purgatory or for a short while on earth? And her reply is one that every saint makes. Jesus, I want to suffer in purgatory, and I want to suffer all the greatest pains on earth, even if it were to the end of the world. When you see the beauty and the goodness and the wonder of God, you would say the same. When we're confronted with the immensity of God, we will think likewise. We will understand the malice of sin, even the smallest sin, and long to do anything, anything, even suffer through the most tormenting times until the end of the world, times like our own. Clearly, We do a great disservice to the dead when we say that they are no longer suffering. How many times people do that after a funeral? Oh, they're no longer suffering. Yeah, 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 that's true. They're no longer suffering in the body. It doesn't mean they're not suffering in their souls. Pains of purification and purgatory. So let us refrain from all such speech and making claims that someone is in heaven. Instead, let us encourage each other to have masses said for them and offer prayers for them. This is why the church wants us to have masses and indulgences. But consider just a line from even the the Dies Irae, which we said today. That's the sequence. Lo, the book exactly worded, wherein all hath been recorded. Thence shall judgment be awarded. When the judge his seat attaineth, and each hidden deed arraigneth, nothing unavenged remaineth. What did St. Faustina say? Even the smallest transgression, even the smallest transgression, will have to be accounted for. It kind of puts a whole new light on people passing away. Oh, they're in heaven. Oh, is that right? Shame on us for thinking like that and behaving like that. Okay. Why does the church want us to offer not only indulgences, but masses, to have masses said for the deceased? Why does the church want us to make sacrifices and and, and do various things, not just for indulgence's sake, but to pray for the dead. Well, in order to understand why this is the case, we must understand first that sin causes at least three things to happen. We incur guilt. Guilt just means I'm responsible for this sin, and I, I can't get away from that responsibility. Then there's a debt of punishment, and then there's stain of sin. Guilt, debt, Stain. These are the three main effects of sin. Now, the last two, 
we can think of in terms of external and internal damages caused by sin. Each time a person sins, he causes chaos and damage in the world. That's the debt of punishment. But he also causes chaos in his soul. That's stain. Stain of sin. So in order to arrive, let's go through these three things now. In order to arrive at the church suffering, which is purgatory, we must be clean and clear of all sin. We can't have any guilt of sin in our souls. We can't be responsible for any sin. So if it's a mortal sin we have in our soul, that must be removed before we die. Through some sort of conversion. Baptism, if we're not baptized. Making a good uh, confession. If there's no priest, no, we have to make a perfect act of contrition. With the help of God's grace. We should never count on that. It may not happen. You cannot make an act of contrition without God's grace aiding you. It's impossible. It's a pure gift of God. Also, with extreme unction, if someone is beyond uh, cognizance and unable to make a response to the priest, if they're truly sorry for their sins, through the application of the extreme unction, the sacrament of extreme unction, anointing, they can be forgiven their mortal sins. Now, if the sin is venial, they can have the responsibility, the guilt, removed by an act of love, by prayer. So, our Lord must take the guilt from our souls. He takes responsibility for them through the sacraments, primarily. But there remains the other two things, the debt of punishment and the stain. Now, the more devoted we are in confession, the more sorry we are, the more those can be alleviated too. If we had perfect, perfect sorrow, truly we're deeply sorry and grieved for our sins, which means we would never commit them again. We'd rather die than commit them again. Then it's, it can be alleviated very quickly through the sacrament of confession. Maybe all of it will be removed. But that's very hard to do. This is why people coming out of confession are not perfect. They still have some work to do. Got some damages to undo, internal and external. Now, as for atoning for these internal and external, let's make an analogy here. Let's think about a young boy and his friend. And they have their slingshot and they're shooting some rocks and having a fun time. But this one of the boys likes to hear the sound of breaking glass. And the next door neighbors have this beautiful house and a picture window there in range of his slingshot. And his friends daring him to, I dare you, you can't hit that window. And so the boy says, oh yeah, I can do it. Besides, I like the sound of breaking glass. And so he puts a rock through the window and it breaks. Okay. There's three things that happen now. He's responsible for the broken window. There's a broken window and he's got this problem inside of him about hearing breaking glass. About trying to show his friend that I'm better than you are and I'm tough. Come on, look what I can do. Well, the first thing he needs to do is go over to his neighbors and kneel down and say, I'm sorry, and he better be sorry. And so he's sorry, and his neighbors, good friends, they say, we forgive you. And so the guilt is removed. But there's still a broken window, right? Now, he's a young boy, he can't pay for it, he doesn't have any money, he's poor. So his dad comes home, sees everything, sees that his son is contrite, See that he's made up to his neighbors. Maybe he helped him. He says, okay, I'll pay for it. Get this solved. And he pulls out a big wad of bills and he pays for the window. Okay, that's the external punishment due to sin, the external damage. That's been paid for. The window's now been paid and replaced. There's still this problem of the boy. Now notice uh, this remuneration for the window 
This can be paid by anybody. It can be paid by his father, by the neighbors themselves. It can be paid by anybody. It's not necessarily it has to come from the boy. But if this boy is going to amend his ways and not keep breaking windows, he must change his disposition, his internal disposition. This changing of his disposition or inclination to break windows is like the punishment due to the internal damages caused by sin. Only the boy can undo this. Dad can't do it for him. But he has to practice saying no to himself, no to his vice, and practice the opposite virtue. And after the good, uh, you can think of the good thief, after he repented on the cross, he said, we deserve this for our sins. He was making up for all his past sins. He was undoing the stain in his soul. That's a biblical example of this, of this idea. So we see here that this is precisely what goes on in purgatory and why it's called the church suffering. The holy souls that undergo suffering both for the external and the internal damages due to sin. They not only suffer for damages they have caused to others, but are purified of all evil tendencies and impurities within themselves. As members of the church, we can help them. That we can actually help the poor souls is a doctrine of our faith. We talked about it yesterday. We know that from the various councils like Lyon, Florence, and Trent. We also know it from the Bible in the book of Second Maccabees. Now, we can help them in at least two ways. There's no opportunity to acquire merit after death. They can't pay for their external punishment, so we can do that for them. That's what we can do. We can earn indulgences. That's why they're called the poor souls. They have no money to pay their debts. So just as the parents can make amends for their boy by paying for the neighbor's broken window, so too we in the church militant, militant can pay the debt of punishment due to the sins of those in purgatory. We can only pay for the external damages, though. The external punishment, not the internal. This is what we're doing by gaining indulgences for them. So a plenary indulgence covers all the external debt of sin for one person. A partial, only a partial of that debt. So if I earn a plenary indulgence for somebody, that's not an immediate go to heaven card. He's got internal problems still he's got to work on. It's not magic. Sometimes I think people look at it a little bit magically. Oh, I got a plenary indulgence. I got everybody out of purgatory. And, uh, maybe, you know, I don't know. As for the internal damage, the boy himself is the only one who can change this disposition, but we can assist him. How? Have masses said for him. That's why we have the mass said for the souls. So that it can be exposed, that that soul can be exposed to Jesus on Calvary and receive that help he needs in overcoming the internal problems in his soul, in wiping clear the stain. This is why St. Gregory the Great had 30 masses prayed in a row for a poor soul who died. So once the indulgences take away the external punishment due to sin and the fires of purgatory burn away the imperfections of a soul, there's nothing to keep that pure soul from heaven. When there is no more fuel for a fire, it goes out. The soul once purified rises happily to heaven. Let us avoid this fire by burning all the fuel while we're still living in this world. And the Lord's giving us plenty of opportunity to do just that. I'd like to end with a little story from St. Alphonsus. He reports that a saint was told of how an angel proposed to a sick man the choice of remaining three days in purgatory or of being confined for two years to his bed by the infirmity under which he labored. The sick man chose the three days in purgatory. But he was scarcely an hour there when he began to complain to the angel that his purgatory, instead of being for three days, had lasted for several years. What? replied the angel. Your body is still warm on the bed of death. And you speak of years. Let us avoid this fire. 
St. John Chrysostom says, if you do not wish to be punished, be your own judge. Chastise and amend yourself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.